imagine yourself an initiate of the brotherhood to whom has been restored the full capacity to enter into the records of one's own causal body and to reach and span beyond that record of individuality and to plumb the depths of the consciousness of the councils of the ascended masters. Imagine that in this elevated state of consciousness, while yet within a fleshly form, you are able with your heart and that divine mind that is the one mind of the one presence to span recorded history, unrecorded history, not only the past and the present, but also to see through the eyes of the divine mind the future destiny to which the mankind of earth are called, to see individually the meaning of mastery, dominion, of being all that an ascended master is, the ruggedness, the compassion, the strength and courage, the ability to overcome adversity. Imagine that you see clearly the path that is to say, not only the path of initiation, but the linear process in time of how both individuals as well as collective societies can set step by step march forward into the glories of a divine future here in this world, and taking leave of that, this world, lifting lightly into the ascended state. Imagine that you have all of this as a burden of light and love upon your heart. And then you are called upon to be able to translate this inner conviction and vision of reality to an relatively unwashed and unsophisticated consciousness of humanity. How to speak to them, how to call them to greatness, how to point the way whereby they, each one individually and collectively, can actually move forward and build for themselves an ascending spiral where victory builds upon victory upon victory and where society and civilization are reformed and fashioned after the divine image. Would this not be a most daunting challenge? Ever it has been so. It has been so in past eras, and it is just as true today as ever it was. For the ascended masters to be able to capture the attention of the light bearers of the world to hold their attention long enough to kindle their heart to hope and faith and charity to awaken the divine consciousness of their Christ presence within them to have their voices, that is, the voices of the Ascended Masters, heard above 
all of the great cacophony of sound that would tend to drown it out. Ever this has been so. Nevertheless, these great ones, these magnificent initiates, have themselves, in the first person, one by one taken incarnation and come forth upon the screen of life. And they have left the record of their lives' examples, and wherever possible, they have left as well those spiritual edifices, those spiritual buildings that sought to bridge the imagination and to call forth, to come in, to summon out of the depths of the heart the greatness that was within, the greatness of the God presence and the Christ presence. To this very day, civilization is the guardian of that written record which they have left for us to once again take up and to be able to profit from the vision that these great ones held in their hearts and knew in the depths of their being, both because of that overshadowing of their own mighty I Am presence, as well as the communion of hearts with those ascended who had gone before. This written record is not unlike the great cathedrals of Europe, these magnificent sermons in stone that took hundreds of years in many cases to complete, buildings that were intended to allow the consciousness to soar, to let the light come in, to tell in color and story and stone and graceful architecture and to elevate the consciousness into that ennobling ma majesty of the divine reality. To this day then, so very many of those great cathedrals still are in the physical, in various places in the Western world. Observe the contrast, however, of those who go through those cathedrals today. To say nothing of the tourists who go through with an idle curiosity and perhaps an eye to some architectural uh, vignette that is studied for its historical value, as well as those who, in their own way, try to enter into the devotional worship of the presence of God therein. If you could only see how precious little of the benefit of those great edifices rubs off and lifts the consciousness of those who enter in, elevating at them into the nobility of spirit and the sense of majesty and beauty of the divine. Too Far too often they are merely places that are where someone goes for a service that takes place. And there is so very little of that appreciation or ennobling of the consciousness that takes place. This, in the case of those great cathedrals and those who stroll through them, oblivious 
of the message that they are capable of conveying. This is the same way that it is for the most part with so much of this legacy which has been bequeathed to Western civilization by the initiates of the Brotherhood in the service that they rendered uh, composing so very many of the great works that they did compose. Today, those works are studied in an arbitrary way for their historical value. Sometimes they are studied uh, to contrast with more modern types, but seldom, if ever, are those works entered into to where the in, there is the ability for there to be a transfer of the consciousness and the divine transcendent vision of the initiate who was seeking to convey their own experiences, their own mystical interactions with the Godhead, and their own visions of the path to freedom, the path to overcoming. In the case of the legacy of the great Chohan, our Lord Maha Chohan, this is most certainly true. Except for those of you who have come to know his heart and his flame, to trust his voice. And that is to say, in this case, to be able to interpret, to absorb, to drink in, and to hear the strains of his indomitable spirit speaking in the cadences, the rhythms, the imagery, the message, the plot line of the stories that he tells, not just to weave a yarn, but in order to gird up an entire civilization, to lift it up and to ennoble a race of humanity and give them the shining example of a formula whereby they too might emulate the heroes and heroines of these stories, learn from them about the path of initiation, learn from them not a marble stereotype of a hero or a demigod or god or goddess, but learn from them the real life visceral mastery that must be engaged in for the path to culminate in the victory of the ascension for individuals and for societies to actually piece their way, pick their way through the pitfalls and the, all of the dangers that menace on so many sides and discover for themselves a means whereby they can actually confront the practical problems of life in this world while staying true to the path, true to the ideals. This then will serve as part of the motif for our forthcoming Easter conclave and for the World Congress to follow. As ever they have, the Ascended Masters shall be, if need be, as a voice crying in the wilderness, crying out, pointing the way without compromise for the path that can and must be followed in order for the personal victory of the ascension 
as well as the advancement, the true advancement of the causes of civilization into the future. You could benefit no greater. In fact, it would be difficult uh, for the Ascended Masters to do any more than to leave this legacy as they have done. Were you to have the good fortune in your own prayer closets or in the uh, privacy of your own life to have the veil parted and to have one or another of the Ascended Masters draw up a chair beside you and say, in essence, to you, come, let us reason together. You would find that when all was said and done, the message that they would convey to you would be the self-same message as is condensed and captured with such sublime beauty and magnificence in the portrayal of some of these stories. The path of the ascension, the path of overcoming, is not a two-dimensional path. That is to say, it isn't some black and white stereotype of a plain vanilla type shallow character nature that appears on the outside to be all sweetness and light and goodness in, in one sense uh, disconnected from all of the challenges of life. Again, when the time comes that you yourselves are ascended, looking back and reading the record not only of your own critical decisions and choices and actions that you yourself, uh, that marked the signposts sign of your own victory, you will also see that in the case of every ascended master who has graduated at least in the last few millions of years from this particular planetary body, you will find that one and all, these were rugged individuals, flesh and blood individuals, who were obliged to choose over and over again for the right, for the ideal, not the expediencies, the compromises that would lead to short-term uh, well-being for their outer selves, but to choose according to the standard of their own beloved mighty I Am Presence. You would find then that one and all, they are a, a very rugged group that has within them, although they may not all sport it on their sleeve in exactly the same way, a tempered nature like unto a well-tempered blade of steel that has been plunged into the fire countless times, plunged upon the anvil and pummeled by the experiences of life countless times, plunged back into the crucible of the fire of life's experiences countless times, quenched in the liquid, shifting from hot to cold and hot to cold back and forth. But every single time, as that raw iron is refined, it becomes more and more pure, more and more strong, holds its keenness of edge, which is to say its ability of the mind to, to be one with the Christ attunement and Christ discrimination, to cleave reality from illusion, to follow the uh, promptings of that one's Christ presence, you will find that in every single case that has been the accumulated momentum of their life's experiences. And you yourselves will find, as you understand that this is indeed 
a part of the path of initiation that the ascended masters, uh, to quote uh, an, an old saying, did not promise you a bed of roses. You will find that as your spirit and your heart adjust to the, that aspect of the path, all the while having the communion of your own beloved individual God presence as the consolation and the solace of your heart, being able to enter into that inner electronic circle of the Holy of Holies of your own mighty presence, and from time to time receiving that glorious comfort and consolation of various ones of the Ascended Masters, and then rhythmically setting forth once again to meet the challenges of life, that you yourself begin to develop this inner rhythm, this inner cadence, so that you are never off guard, so that you are never pushed back because the vicissitudes of this outer world still seem to have some measure of uh, impact upon your own life. But you have that spirit of never giving up, never turning back, of never submitting, of going on that upward path to its very summit, no matter what the adversity might be. So on this occasion of this forthcoming Easter conclave, the great Chohan, our Lord Maha Chohan, is going to speak to you both directly today in his magnificent office, and he is going to speak to you as well as he sought to wrestle with the self-same dichotomies that each of you and the community of the torchbearers of the temple are obliged to wrestle with in this time. That being, how does one honor the cosmic honor flame, the purity and the truths of cosmic law, and still accomplish the necessary service in the outer world so as to keep body and soul together, to uh, per give that service to the world and yet always hold that service to the God presence uh, paramount above all other levels of service. While the Ascended Masters are going to be speaking most directly to their torchbearers. They will be through you and through the anointed representatives speaking to the world as well. For each and every one of you, part of the blessing of this will be to put your feet, to plant your feet upon a very firm foundation to put in proper context the life of this time in the year 2010 in the Western world. Put that in the context of life as it is ongoing now in the Buddhic realm and in the Ascended Master Octave. And to etch clearly in your consciousness a pathway that goes forward before you and eventually lifts off of the surface of the earth a pathway that as you follow it on leads on directly homeward into the heart of the sun behind the sun, the heart of Hyperion. Of course, this pathway being both the pathway of light, the pathway of your divine plan, and the pathway homeward 
in the victory of the ascension. This wonderful work of the journey of life, which is the story of the Godhead charioteers, is one that certain of these great masters have heralded down through the, the centuries. No one more especially than our Lord Maha Chohan. Beginning with his service as Orpheus, he was really back in the prehistory pre times of the Bronze Age as this uh, mystical fleeting figure known as Orpheus. He bequeathed to this infancy of modern Western world, the hardly with the dawn of writing, with the, the dawn of, of enclosed towns and cities, of the rudiments of what would become a civilized society. Already back then, he was telling the story of the Godhead charioteers. He was telling of this tradition that originally the gods and goddesses and all of the human race were born of the self-same root stock. And that for some reasons that were lost in mystery and, and ignorance, so many of the human race had fallen from this high estate. They pitched headlong forward down from the heaven realms into this earthly form. And here they were encased in the prison house of the body, as Orpheus described it. And uh, the motif that he began then was the motif of a journey through life, a journey through this world, an odyssey, if you will. The whole theme was of a disenfranchised individual or group of individuals whose original home, for one reason or another, had been lost, perhaps destroyed, perhaps lost. But in any case, there was the story of the search for the, the original home or the new home, this, this journey, which you now know that the real story was, that was being told was the journey of the Godhead charioteer, the individual mighty I am presence coming forth into incarnation for purposes of its own mastery and overcoming and the journey, return journey back to the heart of the sun. So this is a theme very close to the Maha Chohan's heart one that we will be working on in, in great depth during this class, as well as during the World Congress to follow. Part of the purpose of this is to set the stage for our collective efforts as the disciples of the Ascended Masters to say, to, to understand for ourselves, here we are today. We are here because of where we and all of mankind began our journey with the Godhead charioteers. And this is the way home. This is the course that we can follow to fa find our way homeward. And of course, there are two parallel journeys for us on our way homeward. There is the individual journey that each one of us is on. But as we pursue our individual journey and our individual freedom, dare we, if we are truly possessed of love, ignore the plight of, our, of the orphan humanity that we would otherwise leave behind? Or should we, as we pursue that individual journey, do all within our power collectively to leave a legacy and a, a, a 
framework in which more and more and more individuals can follow that journey. And that, of course, is the formula which has been explained to you over and over again as recently as in the gold print for Cœur de Leon, that the formula always comes back to a, the concept of lowering the divine ideals of a golden age, of forging such a golden age civilization and a society, of establishing a beachhead of such a golden age, then beginning to lay the foundations for it, and stone by stone, building by building, raising it up as an example that the world can then subscribe to and embrace for themselves and follow along with that. So that, it, those are the, the common themes of the heart of our great Lord, the Maha Chohan themes that he has trumpeted across the eras of civilization. It is not by the quirks of history, some accident of history, that the writings of Homer have endured to the present time, or the writings of Virgil, as indeed the writings, of course, of the various embodiments of beloved Saint Germain. They have endured because they have spoken so powerfully to every generation, one generation after another, since pro in the case of Homer, probably 7800 BC. Scribes and individuals had to think enough of that writing. It had to speak to their hearts powerfully enough that they chose to expend their time and energy and lives transcribing, transcribing every few decades, writing over and over and over for hundreds and thousands of years, keeping the written word intact so that it is still there for us today. It is there because forever there has been a power of God consciousness coursing through it, it is, as it were, a living flame, a perfect example of golden helicon streaming on, continuing to have its impact in the consciousness of mankind. All of you, as torchbearers of the temple, are you spontaneously rejoice to have your bearings. There are various terms for this. Sometimes people talk about having their sea legs. From time to time, we have spoken about the North Star of the will of God, furnished to us by beloved El Moria, that so long as we have that North Star, we can chart our course through life. And so it is with this formula of overcoming this legacy that has been left to us, that has spoken down through the millennia. It is a way of us all knowing what we are to do together, of the great mission that we have to do at this time. It is templed order, templed service, and templed building, building up constructively after this divine design which has been left for us by the Ascended Masters. The writings of Virgil, the Aeneid, of course, was written in ancient Latin. In uh, the latter part of the 1600s, around 1690, uh, it was translated into modern, modern English of that time by Dryden, who was himself an accomplished poet and writer. 
who saved his best genius for translating these immortal glyphs of God consciousness from the ancient Latin into the English of his time. He did a magnificent job of laying forth for the patrons who supported his work. What he understood correctly was the motivation of the heart of the Maha Chohan in writing, in this case, the Aeneid. I'd like to share with you for just a few moments his assessment of that, for it speaks to the greatness of your own mission, as well as the, the call to greatness on the part of all of the Ascended Masters, the challenge that they hurl to all of us as their disciples in embodiment, not just to those who are presently the torchbearers, but it is a call that they, will, that they are sending forth into the ethers. They are sending it forth across the mental plane of the planet. They're sending it forth across the feeling plane of the planet. That light is going forth. And it is continuing to be applied as a steady pressure upon the heart flames, the sleeping, slumbering heart flames of those who are called to this great work. And it is in the, re the chalicing of that that you perform your service. And it is as each of you are yourselves inspired to strive for the greatness of your own Christ presence and the greatness of your mighty I am presence. What is meant by this? Well, humorously, one little image that comes to mind in this regard is the photos that I'm sure many of you have seen from time to time of a toddler, a young boy of maybe four, or maybe it's a young girl of four or five, in the case of the young boy, you see him wearing his father's number 12 Oxford loafers, trying to navigate in those loafers. Or you see the little toddler girl with her tousled hair trying to wobble around in her mother's high heels, her pearls, whatever other little symbols of her mother's attire she wears. This is, a, in one sense, part of the challenge that all torchbearers face, is growing up from that infancy, that, that adolescent stage, growing into the stature the heroic stature of the mature firstborn Christed individual of the individualized mighty I am presence. Take it to be the stature of the Christ presence with those five character traits that you are coming to know so well. But even that is not the full stature that you are challenged to grow into, for it is the full stature of the individualization of the I am, that I am, the mighty I am presence, that you are challenged to grow into, to be able to have so many of those divine character, tra character traits of the ascended masters. It is necessary to study those traits as a Great one once said, learn to love, to, to do well, and you shall. And I can tell you, having studied in great detail the lives of many of these ascended masters, it is quite a heartwarming realization to watch as they 
wrestle with so many of these things in their own embodiments, turning them over and over again in their hearts and minds, studying them from every possible point of the compass, writing about them, extolling them, hypothesizing about them, coming to a realization of them, and to now see today the full out picturing of that and realize the seeds of that greatness that were sown as they studied those, those character traits uh, as unascended initiates along the path. So as you study them, as you learn to act the part and understand the part of the greatness of your Christ presence and your God presence, more and more you will discover that you are able to outpicture those caricature traits, character traits for yourself. So that was part of the purpose of giving so many years of his life to one literary work, the, 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 a labor of love of the Lord Maha Chohan, to paint this picture for a certain time and a certain group of, of a civilization and its peoples that they would rise into that depiction of nobility of spirit, of royalty of spirit, and all that was intended to come forth. Even someone who was not, outwardly at least, by any stretch of the imagination, trained in this, these principles, he was able to recognize the great heart of the Mahachohan in writing these, these works. And here's what he had to say about it. A heroic poem is undoubtedly the greatest work which the soul of man is capable of performing. The design of such a poem is to form the mind to heroic virtue by example. Tis to con it is conveyed in verse that it might delight while it instructs. The action of it is always one, entire and great. In other words, the scope of the whole poem is held in consciousness simultaneously. The least and most trivial episodes or underactions which are woven into it are parts either necessary or convenient in order to advance the main design. Either they are necessary that, so that without them the poem would be imperfect or so convenient that no others could be imagined more suitable to the place in which they are positioned in the poem. There is nothing to be left void in such a firm building. Even the cavities ought not to be filled inside with rubbish, which is of a perishable kind, destructive to the strength. He's alluding to the fact that in other times, if you had two outer walls, you would fill the, the middle with whatever kind of leftover uh, rubble was handy. And Dryden is saying that even the inconsequential passages had to be polished and perfected rather than just a throwaway line. There is nothing to be left void in a firm building. Even the cavities ought not to be filled with rubbish, which is of a perishable kind, destructive to the overall strength, but rather with brick or stone, though of less pieces, nevertheless of the same nature, fitted into all the crannies. Even the least proportion portions must be of the epic temper. All things must be solemn, majestic, and sublime. Nothing of a foreign nature, nothing like the tri trifling novels which others would have inserted into their poems, by which the reader is misled into other sorts of pleasures, the opposite to that which is designed in such an epic poem. One raises the soul and tempers it to virtue, whereas the other softens it and unbends it to vice. One leads to the poet's aim and completes his work, which he is driving on, laboring and hastening in every line. 
whereas the other slackens his pace and diverts him from his way and locks him up like a knight errant within an enchantment, an enchanted castle, while he should be pursuing his first adventure. So there you have laid forth the argument of why any author would undertake a true epic. And of course, this is uh, the very epitome of the attempt, the intent of the Maha Chohan and the intent from time to time of beloved Saint Germain and others as they have sought to uh, write these great works in antiquity. Further on in the introduction, speaking of the main character, the main hero of the story, Aeneas by name, Dryden goes on to explain. I will then pass many lesser objections for want of room to answer them. What follows next is of great importance if the critics can make out their charge. For it is leveled at the manners which our poet Virgil gives to his hero. These manners were piety to the gods, a dutiful affection for his father, a love of his relations, a care for his people, a courage and a conduct in the war, a gratitude to those who had obliged him, and justice to all mankind in general. We are not going to today take up all of those points. But I think you see there that even in this introduction, there is laid forth, if you will, a counterpoint to the Christ virtues. Piety, which is honor and devotion and worship to the Godhead and fairness and justice and um, courage in the face of all adversity. Let's just touch upon one, that is piety. Piety takes the place of all as the chief part of Aeneas' character. The word in Latin is more full than can possibly be expressed in any modern language. For in Latin, it means not only devotion to the gods, but a filial love and tender affection to relations of all sorts. In this instance, uh, the deities of his time are made the companions to Aeneas's flight. They appear to him on his voyage, they advise him on his path, and at last he, he installs them in his new home in Italy and makes that uh, their home for all the future. It goes on and on, and these are many of the things that we will touch upon as we, we go into this class. One of the terms that is used throughout to describe the epics of these stories is the term hero. This is a phrase which goes back as far as the instruction of our beloved Saint Germain, when he was writing his uh, work as Hesiod, he described an age of the divine heroes. Later on, as Plato, he also defined the term in a way that is going to be quite significant and perfectly in step with the theme of our forthcoming Easter class. Let me first share with you the few lines from the uh, Chronicle of Beloved Saint Germain as Hesiod. You may recall, of course, the, the time and the cycle of the Golden Age and the race of that age, which was known as the Golden Race. You may recall that after that time, there was the Age of Silver, uh, where the feeling world took charge, the energies of the feeling 
superseding the energies of the divine consciousness symbolized by the gold. After this golden age and the silver age came the age of bronze, which overlaps with the age of the heroes. The bronze age is when uh, armaments of war were forged and many, many great wars were fought. This was when uh, civilization was coming out of the pre-dawn of not having had much by way of written and, uh, history and literature into a time when those things were able to be chronicled and set down for posterity. Following this Bronze Age then, before com coming to the Age of Iron, Iron, of course, is the age in which uh, Hesiod uh, admits that he is alive. And it's interesting, he notes, would that he were not born in that era altogether, but that he had lived in this time of greatness that preceded him. In this case, he goes then and puts in between the age of bronze and the age of iron, he inserts another age, which is the age of the heroes. And here is what he has to say about that age. I'm going to share with you the lead up to that Bronze Age or to that uh, age of heroes by... Uh, Introducing the Bronze Age. Zeus the father made a third race of mortals, this time of bronze, not at all like the silver ones. They were fashioned from the ash tree and were dreadful and mighty and bent on harsh deeds of war and violence. They ate no bread and their hearts were strong as stone. No one could come near them for their strength was great and mighty arms grew from the shoulders of their sturdy body. Bronze were their weapons, bronze their homes, and bronze was what they worked, for there was no black iron back then. With their hands they worked one another's destruction and reached the dank home of cold Hades, nameless. Black death claimed them for all their fierceness, and they left the bright sunlit world behind them. And when the earth had covered over this race, Zeus, son of Kronos, made and fashioned upon the nourishing land another race, better and more just. These were the divine race of the heroes who were called demigods. They precede us on this boundless earth. Eventually, even for them, evil war and dreadful battle wiped them out. Nevertheless, others of them Father Zeus, son of Kronos, settled at the northern ends of the earth apart from mankind and gave them their shelter and food, where they live to this day with hearts unburdened by cares in the isles of the blessed. These blissful heroes, for whom three times a year the barley-giving land brings forth full grain, sweet as honey. So he is there pointing out that there was a transition, that while the world may have rejected those heroic life streams who came forth, that God took them up and one way or the other secreted them away in what we now know as the retreats of the Ascended Masters and in the Ascended Master Octaves, where they live on as that age that you have been taught is the age of Kronos, the golden age that Saint Germain cannot forsake, this divine ideal of men living on in their perfection and their eternal youth with nature giving forth of all of her abundance uh, at the divine decree of these great heroic life streams. Now here is what when he came back as Plato, St. Germain himself built upon this theme of the Age of Heroes.
I think that I completely agree with you, Socrates. What about the name hero? What is it? This one isn't so hard to understand because the name has been altered so very little. In itself, it expresses the fact that heroes were born out of love. Love being eros. So you put the H sound in front and you have heroes. So heroes are those who are masterful and practiced in love. How do you mean? Don't you know that these heroes are the demigods? All of them sprang from the love of God and mortal. It is as if you investigate the matter by relying on the old Attic uh, linguistics, you will get a better understanding, since that will reveal that the name hero, Heros, is only slightly altered form of the word love, Eros, the very thing from which the heroes have sprung forth. Either this is the reason they were called heroes, or else because they were wise lovers of wisdom, clever speech makers, and dialecticians. Therefore, as we were saying just now, heroes turns out to be speech makers. Hence, the noble breed of heroes turns out to be a race of speech makers and sophists. So here, our own beloved Saint Germain has alluded to the very formula of the ray of divine love as the third ray of the seven rays and the ray of the third secret ray of sacrifice, alluding to the fact that heroic accomplishments, heroic acts of courage are able to be brought forth when there is this internal pressing forth of the secret ray of love, the rose of light consciousness upon the heart chakra. That is the motivating factor that allows individuals to transcend their mortal nature and to strive to accomplish those heroic deeds and services to life that really are not part of the nature of mortality, but, are, but spring directly from the divine nature of the mighty God presence. That you may trust you as we go into this class, while we will be utilizing the sublime beauty of expression that the, the Maha Chohan condensed into writing, the real theme of this class is that secret ray of divine eros, not the, the way that term has been plagiarized by the modern world, but the way in which St. Germain and others used it in the past to, be, to speak of this uh, love that comes forth out of the union of God and man, of them reuniting, and of that love that blossoms as compassion, as being moved with compassion for the plight of mankind, for the plight of one's brothers and sisters, so that to such a degree, move to such a degree that one brushes aside the natural instincts of human nature and love is compelled to find a way through the necessities of life. Love is compelled to tackle the improbable or the impossible and bring it forth as the victory of the divine light overcoming. So that theme will be very much the theme of our conference. We will be talking then 
as the great Chohan lays out this great path and journey homeward, chronicling love's labors and love's journeys. We are really and truly, regardless of whatever else is going on in our lives, that is really the backdrop of what of our lives. We are eternally grateful to have the freedom of understanding that no matter what this outer life might seem to be, this outer three-dimensional path, and even more so the life of the memory body, the life of the soul, that behind all of that is the epic journey of the Godhead charioteer, of our own mighty I Am presence, that we are all on that epic journey. And we now know our destination. We now know the necessary process whereby we can complete that journey. We now know the, the, the temple of identity that we must build here in this world of form. We now know the architecture of the golden age society, whether you call it the golden age of one or the ascended master way of life. We now know how it is that we are, must uh, conduct ourselves as this conference then will accumulate that rolling momentum of the ruby ray of sacrifice, of love, of compassion, so that it fills our feeling world. Now, here is a great key for many of you who find yourselves from time to time uninspired about your future, unmotivated about your life, unable to pick yourselves up and be enthusiastic and passionate about the path. This key is to step down the internal love born of the Godhead of your mighty I Am presence and transfer that so that it is full-blown in first your heart, and then your heart is able to transfer it especially to your feeling world, so that your feeling becomes this great ocean of God desire, this great ocean of God passion that is filling all of your feelings, lifting and inspiring the mind, as that is cultivated, as it is guarded, you will find that the pressure of that God desire will be such an irrevocable forward momentum that it will motivate you to move forward and it will work in the mysterious ways of the divine alchemies to part the waters of opposition and to bring forth in upon the screen of life the manifestation of the service to life that you desire to bring forth. It is a well-laid plan that the Ascended Masters have set forth for us. For during this class, they are going to give us the scope of the past, the present moment, and the future as it relates to where we are at this moment in time. And then we as a collective body of torchbearers will be able to, with great relish, launch into the, uh, the practical process of being about the business of that mission, of lowering it into manifestation. So our, the keynote for our World Congress then is going to be laying the foundations for the Great Commission, our heroic labors of love. And we will see ourselves as those pioneers upon uh, the screen, 
the Aeneases of our own time, that are establishing this, uh, this beachhead of the dawning golden age of St. Germain, building from where we are today, taking the practical steps that are within our power and laying the foundations for future ones as well, translating that overall vision as well as the, the particular goals and objectives that are laid upon our shoulders and our hearts by beloved El Moria, the wisdom of the Darjeeling Council, which I'm sure you appreciate that uh, all the Chohans are members of the Darjeeling Council. We will then be so joyful to rush to the practical uh, process of how we translate this vision and this journey and set about bringing it into manifestation. As we do so, may each and every one of you feel a lightness in your step in the sense that you are not stultified, that you are not simply going round and round and round in a cycle of endless vanity, that where you find yourself embodiment after embodiment exactly where you started, but rather that you are actually progressing, and we together are actually progressing and bringing this vision of the brotherhood into divine manifestation and not doing it by ourselves but by the very real engaging with the ascended masters as you will see as we study the life of Aeneas he is given certain assignments and in the course of his pursuit of those assignments, as he is willing to follow along with the divine direction that has been laid upon his heart, that brings him into association with various ones of uh, the traditional Greek pantheon, as they were uh, then known, the pantheon of the Olympic gods, but as you now know, the ascended masters. And that then is the joy that we lay upon your hearts, that you, each one, are given the opportunity of taking up the work of the Ascended Masters, of being useful to their cause. Each one of these Ascended Masters have their own projects that they are keenly desirous of advancing here in this world of form. And you may be assured that as you each one can be of, of service in advancing their work, that that is far and away the greatest mechanism for coming into association, a working relationship with those ascended masters, for them to draw you into closer association and discipleship with them for them to obtain uh, grants and dispensations to free you for the service uh, on their behalf that they would have you do, the opportunity for much good to be done if you should be alleviated of certain limitations that otherwise might come your way. You little dream of the changes that take place at inner levels when the outer self, the outer soul and its four lower bodies, finally undertakes the mantle of the mission of that one's own mighty I am presence and the cooperation of that one's own mighty I am presence with the brotherhood of light. It truly changes everything. And while many times it might seem as if the wheels of the gods do grind exceedingly slow, they do grind on exceedingly fine. And in the fullness of time, you will look back 
and you will observe and read the record of how from the time when you put your hand in full earnestness to the work of your presence, its great service and mission to life, the cooperation with the fellowship of the brotherhood, that from that moment on, at inner levels, it has been a straight upward ascent for your life stream. And you have been counted within the communion of this most joyful of bodies of all associations, that being the communion of the entire spirit of the Brotherhood of Light. On behalf, then, of that entire Brotherhood, you are invited to come to this conclave, to this World Congress. Renew your spirits. Give of the motivation and the genius of your own uh, inspiration and to set the wheels in motion whereby once that uh, fortnight of these two events is concluded, that that building process will continue on and on and on. <laughs>